Well, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. If Forrest Gump's on TV, I'm probably going to stop and watch it. <laughs> last week, last evening, an evening last week, I was doing some sermon planning, and I said to myself, this is going to have to wait, because Forrest Gump's on TV. So I tuned in to Forrest Gump. It's my all-time favorite movie, I think, if I was probably being honest. I, I enjoy it. I love it. There's never a dull moment from start to finish in that movie, and so I enjoy watching it. I used to think that talking about Forrest Gump in a sermon was relevant, but now I realize the movie's almost 30 years old, which makes me feel older, and I don't know about any of you all, but um, boy, that was a long time ago. But I really enjoy Forrest Gump, and it's not just the fact that the central character story is, is so exciting and brilliant. I mean, Forrest Gump teaches Elvis how to dance. He goes on to be a star football player under Bear Bryant at the University of Alabama, he, gosh, what else did he do? He, be, he becomes a star ping pong player. He serves in Vietnam and wins the Congressional Medal of Honor. He meets three presidents along the way. He helps other people get, get rich. I, I mean, what a story. What a central character to a story is Forrest Gump. But I think one of the other reasons I really like Forrest Gump is the strong, strong supporting characters in that movie. Yeah, Tom Hanks's Forrest Gump is, is wonderful, but, but what about Lieutenant Dan and Bubba? What about Jenny? And that little-known actress named Sally Fields as Mrs. Gump. I mean, that is about the strongest supporting cast you'll ever see in a movie. And the performances are just as strong. It's not just the performances that are brilliant, but, but those characters add such a, a quality and a richness to that story. And despite all of the adventures that Forrest Gump goes on, all the exciting situations he finds himself in, it usually often comes back to Mama or Jenny or Bubba or Lieutenant Dan. The supporting characters in Forrest Gump are brilliant, and they remind us that supporting characters and supporting casts aren't minor or unimportant roles. No, they're, they're not just fillers. They, they give completion to the whole story. That's why we have categories devoted at award shows to best supporting actors and characters. I mean, imagine certain movies without certain supporting actors. Imagine Gone with the Wind without Hattie McDaniel, or Good Will Hunting without Robin Williams. Imagine Ghost without Whoopi Goldberg, or imagine Jerry Maguire without Cuba Gooding Jr. We wouldn't be able to say, show me the money. It wouldn't mean anything. Those stories could not be told without important supporting actors, supporting actors that make the story complete. Without the supporting actor, the story isn't really possible. It couldn't stand. So their acting may be astounding, but their part in the story is just as important and unforgettable. Well, today's parables are like movies we've seen. We've got a central character, but we've also got other actors, supporting actors, shepherd and sheep and a woman and a coin, the prodigal son. They represent concepts and realities that the whole story revolves around. But there's also a supporting actor who we kind of like to... We don't like to finish the movie because there's a supporting actor that enters the scene towards the end of the passage, and that's the supporting actor we don't really like to give too much credit to or don't like to include them in the story. It's the shepherd and the sheep, the woman and the coin, the father and the prodigal son, not the resentful older son, right? That's not included in the story. Yeah, it is. Yes, it is. It's a vital supporting role that we cannot ignore and must pay attention to. So today, we're going to talk about these parables of being lost and found. But we'll be sure not to leave out that supporting actor towards the end as a critical part of the story. Just as Bubba and Jenny are vital to the story of Forrest Gump, so the older son is vital to our understanding of what it means to be lost and found. And so the scripture begins with an important context. Two short verses Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners. For a pure and righteous Jewish rabbi, that was not okay. 
It wasn't like Jesus just met someone for a burger and they went about their way. This table fellowship implies that Jesus welcomes these tax collectors and sinners into his presence. It's a sign of hospitality and inclusion. And in the same way, those who are sitting at the table, they're receptive to Jesus' message. They find something appealing and warm and hospitable about Jesus. And so they join this Jewish rabbi who they might not otherwise take, take part in a dinner with at Jesus' invitation. So they join Jesus at the dinner table, and the religious leaders call it out. They say, this is not okay. This is not okay. This is unacceptable. This breaks the law, the customs, the cultures, and the rituals. Jesus, you've been contaminated at this point. So after hearing this, Jesus begins into three separate but related parables. Three separate parables that tell very similar stories, that talk about something of great value that's lost, that very thing being found or returning on its own, and then the great celebration that ensues after the lost is found. There's, of course, the lost sheep, the one who wanders away from the 99. And the shepherd leaves the other 99 to go find this one sheep. And when he does, he throws it over his shoulders, goes back, and they throw a party. They throw a celebration because this lost sheep has been found. There is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who changes his heart and life than 99 righteous folks. And I think Jesus is saying, hey, Pharisees, that's you who think you're just fine. What about the woman who loses one of her ten coins? That's that's pretty valuable. She's going to go looking for it, and so she has a light. She's looking under the chair, under the bed. She's digging through the dirt of her house, and she finally finds the coin. Now, I don't know about you, but when I find a coin in my house, my day doesn't change all that often. I know some of you are probably the type that like to look in the parking lot to find pennies and dimes and nickels and quarters. That's all great. But when I find a coin, I don't get terribly excited about it. The woman throws a party. She finds the lost coin and she invites her friends and neighbors over to celebrate because she's found her coin. When she finds it, she celebrates. Joy breaks out in the presence of God's angels when one sinner changes their heart. And then there's the story that we, we all know. We heard it read up here in dramatic fashion just a little bit earlier. The prodigal son, the lost son, says to his father, Dad, you're you're dead to me. I want what's owed to me. I'm leaving. So he takes his inheritance. He squanders it. He lies with the pigs, which is the absolute worst of the worst when it comes to behavior in that culture. He eventually realizes that he's desperate and he feels guilt or shame or hopelessness or or all of that wrapped into one. And he heads back to his father, ready to give his speech. Before he even has the chance, the father sees him, runs out to him, throws his arms around him and says, it's time to celebrate. You've come home. You've come home. Let's celebrate. Get the robe. Get the ring. Get the 4-H calf so we can eat it. This son of mine was lost and now he's found. He was dead and now he's alive. Let's celebrate. The parallelism is working so well in these three simple stories, isn't it? They convey the very same truth. Celebrate with me because I have found what is lost. This son of mine is dead, was dead, and is now alive. There's rejoicing in heaven. There's rejoicing on earth. Celebrate good times. Come on. And then comes verse 25. Then comes verse 25, where the supporting actor enters the scene. He said, Dad, I never disobeyed your instructions. Yet you've never given me as much as a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. This son of yours, I won't even use his name, this son of yours returned after gobbling up your whole estate on on prostitutes and you slaughtered the fattened calf for him? We say, Jesus, did, did we really need this part of the story? 
couldn't you have just left it? You didn't have to tell this part. It was going so well. It was such a feel-good story, wasn't it? Of course Jesus includes it, because we need these challenges in our lives if we are going to grow as disciples. The season of Lent is about personal reflection and praying about and studying how we can become more like Jesus during this 40 days leading up to Easter. And so this story with this supporting actor, the elder son, is supposed to teach us something. And it teaches us something important about the story. It teaches us, of course, that pride and legalism can befall any of us at any given time, so watch out. Pride and legalism can befall us at any given time. We want ours, and we want ours before the others. The others need to get in line before we receive our blessing. The son's reaction isn't really that surprising. This isn't a shocking reaction. The son, the older son, wants justice, but it embodies the mentality that God's grace is mandated on my terms. And the story of the prodigal son says, not so. God's grace is unending, and those are the terms that God has set for the world. God's grace is unending. So there, are, there is a truth and a question that I believe that we can derive from this parable and all the parables put together. One truth is that God's grace and forgiveness is completely absurd. The older son is right. God's grace is completely and utterly absurd in the most sacred and divine way. God's grace is amazing and awe-inspiring, and to us sinners can oftentimes seem unfair even, but God's grace is just that big. God's grace and forgiveness is completely absurd in the best, the best possible way. But then there's a question we must ask ourselves if we are to accept that truth. Will we celebrate the scandalous grace of God with the angels and the friends of the shepherd and the friends of the woman and the friends of the prodigal son and the father? Will we celebrate it? Or will we allow that pride to sneak in? Will we become like the elder son or the Pharisees at the very beginning of the passage and say, no, God's grace isn't quite that big. We've got to stop somewhere, right? The central message of this gospel is grace, acceptance, and forgiveness in the name of Jesus. And maybe we need this supporting actor, the Son, to remind us of how crazy and big that grace is. Maybe we need this elder son to remind us that the gospel is indeed offensive in the best possible way. The gospel is offensive to those who want to live by my rules and my way. But we can learn from this passage, the three parables together, and even from the supporting actor, that God's grace is bigger than our imagination. The good news says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. I don't see anywhere in the text where Jesus says, yeah, but first you got to go through a background check. Or down payment, please, before I accept you unto my table. Jesus doesn't say, ah, I see your history the past few years. I need you to have five years of right behavior before you come and eat at my table. Jesus doesn't say, ah, oh, I see you still struggle with that sin. Well, you need to get that completely taken care of before I can welcome you into my presence. I don't see Jesus saying, oh, you're prone to relapse. You need a five-year clean record first. Jesus doesn't say any of that. Jesus runs out and embraces us and welcomes us home every time. 
The parable of the prodigal son, the lost coin, and the lost sheep subvert all the Pharisees are thinking in those opening two verses. Believing that there comes a point when you can be so far gone, you have no place in our presence. And Jesus doesn't stand for it. In fact, he tells three stories to drive the point home. I'll be honest, I find myself in the shoes of the older brother more often than I'd like. And that's not just because I am physically an older brother, and I truly am the most responsible and well-behaved and smartest of all my siblings. That has nothing to do with it. (laughs) But pride befalls us easily. I think in our righteous quest for equality, justice, fairness. We want to work that out. We're we're like the brother in that sense, but we have to understand, and the parable is challenging us to come to the understanding that it is not up to us to set those terms. Jesus sets those terms, and the terms are, welcome home. I receive you into my arms. You know what your terms are? To celebrate Every time someone comes home and enters the arms of Jesus, you are to celebrate. We are to celebrate. We are to celebrate. There is no custom, no law, and no sin that stops us from celebrating anyone running into the embrace of Jesus. I have no idea if the son went back out into the field, hung his head, kicked rocks, rolled his eyes at dad. Or maybe he heard the words of the father, these last few words, and softened his heart. Maybe he heard the father say, son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. If I could write the parable beyond the limits of the chapter, I would say, the elder son hears these words, he softens his heart, and he goes and joins the celebration. That's what we're called to do, by the way. If there is still any lingering pride in your heart or mind, it's time to join the celebration in that Jesus welcomes sinners and tax collectors, whoever that is in 2021, into his presence. And we're here to celebrate that. The greatest supporting character in all of the New Testament, I would probably say, is the Apostle Paul. And I think he might see himself that way also. He was a righteous Pharisee once himself, so he was trained in this thought And to the Romans, he would say, I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus our Lord, not death or life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor present things or future things, not powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other thing that is created can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. That is the truth that we live by And that is the truth through which we celebrate. So First Baptist Church, let's be sure we're always celebrating, always remembering to throw a party when anyone runs to or returns to the arms of the main character, Jesus Christ. What if we make it our mission to invite anyone and everyone without delay to join us in this celebration? I believe that there are many in our community after a pretty rough year, are ready to join in this celebration, that there is new life among us, and that God is still welcoming the lost into his arms. So let's play that supporting role that God calls us to. We are not the main character of the story, and I hope that after a few months we've come to understand that, but we play an important supporting role. Are you ready to play that role as individuals? Are you ready to play the supporting role that God has called us to in welcoming the sinner home? Let's pray together.
Lord, we give thanks for these parables, and we especially are grateful for the meaning that we find in the story of the prodigal son. And Lord, even at this time, we're thankful for the elder son, the supporting actor of this story who we often like to ignore. But this presence has taught us something. It has taught us and it has reminded us of how great and grand and unending your grace is. May we take on the quality of the Father who is excited to welcome the sinner home, who is excited to welcome the lost into his loving embrace. May we swallow our pride and may we give thanks and celebrate when we find our way into your loving embrace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.